In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In these few weeks between Epiphany and the beginning of Lent, we follow the opening passages of Mark's Gospel, a tense and fast-moving narrative in which Jesus appears as though from nowhere, and having been baptised from John, immediately sets out to have his impact on the world. Healing, driving out demons, calling his first disciples. Today's gospel ends with his preparing to extend his gospel power from his local milieu to a wider sphere. The lectionary, however, has skipped over a significant passage of just three verses in its tour through this first chapter over the past few weeks. Between his baptism by John and his call of the first disciples and encounter with the forces of evil in a possessed man, Jesus himself has a direct and definitive experience of spiritual warfare. Straight after his baptism, we're told, the Spirit drove him to the desert, and famously he was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now the reason for this omission is not mysterious or sinister, it's because we will go back to read that passage shortly on the first Sunday in Lent, since the story of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness is one of the stories that guides our observance of that season. However, in attempting to avoid repetition for us, the lectionary has arguably subverted Mark's narrative, and if we're not careful, the Gospel itself Now, I don't want to steal too much of the thunder of your clergy for two weeks from now when that story of the temptation in the wilderness is told, but we can't understand the way in which Jesus appears and begins to have his impact in the world without it. And in particular, in today's passage, about the beginning of his wider mission, mission, there is a hint back to that earlier story, which is significant. So today's episode in the Gospel has followed on from his appearance in the Capernaum synagogue where he had cast out an unclean spirit, so more demon references, bear in mind, and now today we hear that he heals Peter's mother-in-law and that subsequently the whole town of Capernaum is camped out on his doorstep in the evening waiting for his healing and his exorcism. And after this we're told that he got up while it was still dark and he went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. Now, without context, it would be very tempting to turn this sort of moment, this uh, shuttling back and forth between the crowd and the intimate space of Peter's home, and then movement to the desert, we could turn this recurrent pattern in the Gospel, because it does recur, just into a sort of messianic work-life balance issue. And then the resort to a deserted place for prayer by Jesus gets reduced to a sort of self-care strategy on his part. The desert becomes a happy venue for prayer and presumably for communing with nature and so forth. This is not really the point of this story. Biblical tradition does often connect the spiritual life and the desert, but it does not do so because the desert is a place of beauty. The desert is beautiful, but The wilderness, the desert, is also dangerous. You can only romanticise a desert if you've been able to park your car at the visitor centre and you're assured of a comfortable place to sleep after you've had a good look around. Because without good cell phone service, the desert is a different kind of place. The desert is the place that lays bare the realities of the spirit, and not only for good. To go out into the desert that step away from the world of community and culture, from the crowd of the narrative, from human relationship altogether. This step is one that Jesus takes, but in fact, if we remember that it is an echo of that earlier story of his 40 days, we might reasonably infer it's a step to which he's been driven by the Spirit. But Jesus goes in any case to pray again, but just as before, not because the desert is holy or good, but because it is there that things are clear. And they are clear there because there is less. And the deeper truths of ourselves can thus be encountered, must be encountered, without distraction. But the deeper truths about ourselves and about the world are not always welcome or attractive. This, nonetheless, 
is what Jesus goes out to do. Just as was the case for Jesus 40 days, wilderness experiences in Scripture, and there are quite a few, they're not usually a matter of choice, but rather of call or necessity, like the Spirit driving Jesus to the wilderness. But even in the background of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, there is, of course, the famous story of Israel's 40 years in the wilderness after the Exodus story on their way to the Promised Land. And that 40 years was not chosen. It was not that the journey should have taken that long, but rather that it was part of their relationship with God. It was inflicted, in effect. It was an experience which reflected Israel's lack of faith. It was not an ideal time. It was not always a holy or a prayerful time. It involved great suffering. And yet, biblical tradition was to look back on that foundational experience of 40 years in the wilderness as a time of unique intimacy between Israel and Israel's God. Because in that time, the bare reality of dependence on God by God's people was unmistakable. So once we disentangle our notions of how the spiritual life works, once we remove it from the consumerist notion of spirituality as something that we can control, choose, or even curate, we may understand that we may be driven out at times, as Jesus was, into the desert. And then some other experiences of the moment may look different. Even perhaps the pandemic might look different. For is this not a wilderness experience of the moment that we're experiencing as individuals, as households, and as church? Like the wilderness of old, there are demons about. This is a dangerous, a deadly time. But here, there is also something to learn, something to gain if we dare make ourselves open to what this struggle could reveal. Yes, I suggest our experience in the past months has been a kind of enforced desert experience. Of course, you wouldn't be likely to compare these to a retreat or to some intentional period of spiritual refreshment. But you've already heard me hint, I think, that those notions may be to misunderstand the way in which the wilderness and the desert function. We have discovered things about ourselves. Some of us are depressed and lonely. Others who are together are fed up with each other. Some, on the other hand, are finding new ways to give and receive with a tenderness and compassion that they may have discovered in this period. Some of us are finding new ways to serve and care for those who are vulnerable. Some of us are coming to understand more deeply our dependence on God. Things that were likely already true about ourselves and one another are being exposed more clearly for good or ill, because here things are clear. So yes, as I've already mentioned, Lent is almost upon us, and you may not feel this Lent that you really need to think about giving something up, because so much has already been taken away from us. But whether or not that's your choice, know this. We have been driven into this desert for a purpose. We have to understand that we have gone out to pray like Jesus did, not necessarily by choice, but perhaps to do so more fervently because of these circumstances, even without all the things that we as church tend to treat as the joyful aids to prayer, our music, our community, our buildings, our symbols. Here in this time of separation, when we have less, we are offered the clarity, sometimes the beauty, and yes, the danger too, simply of having less. What we discover about ourselves in this moment may not be welcome, but it will be true. We too may be tempted, as Jesus was, because prayer is not only about our connection with God, but we too have angels to wait on us, and we have a God whose care for us is deeper than we may now know. That experience of waiting on God and that sense of frustration about the lack of evidence for what God is doing in the world is spoken of all too clearly in our first lesson today. The prophet addresses a people who, like us, may be asking what on earth God is doing. 
Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The prophet goes on to offer comfort in those remarkable words. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. At the end of the gospel today, Jesus is ready to walk, to go on his way with renewed strength. He uses the same term for this purpose that the evangelist had used at the beginning of the story for his desert prayer, but Jesus now applies it to his mission. The evangelist had Jesus going out to pray, and now Jesus says, let us go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. Come out, God says, come out to pray now in this wilderness time if you have not done so. For God will in time give us new strength, this God who calls us all to proclaim his message, for this is what he has called us to do. Amen.